Excellent. So we actually have 50 people already with us on stage. Hello, everyone. Hi, Sally. Welcome back. And we have a very, very special guest today with us, Don Sparling. Welcome, Don. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. So good to have you. We've had a, a really good day and a half, actually. So we are heading towards the end of the conference. But this is a very special moment, I think, because just a few hours before we had a conference a keynote really about open source, the community and the power that this has for the public, really. And I really like that you're now going to talk a little bit more about Brno specifically, right? How the city changed. Yes. I, I, what I want to do, uh, should I start now right away? Yes. Uh, if you want to, absolutely. Uh, just one reminder for the people that are watching this, if you, you know, want to share with us what you think, we have the chat right here in the virtual event, but you can also tweet. So you can follow us at devconf underscore CZ with the hashtag, and we also have an account. So you know, if you want to share anything with us, we're always happy to hear from you uh, on Twitter right here. And uh, just to give you maybe a, a brief introduction, uh, Don is with us. He is originally Canadian, but he's been living in Brno for, I think you said 50 years? 50. More than 50. More than 50. More than 50 years, which is a very, very long time, actually. Okay. And Don, you were telling me before that you you were a university professor. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which is quite yeah, fascinating. I was, I, was, I was in the English department. I was doing language literature and things like that. Right. Right. And I guess you will tell us a bit more what brought you to Brno, how I guess you fell in love? Uh, after I came to Brno. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's excellent. So I think also this is very relevant because of course the DevConf uh, is hosted and really was born out of the Brno office and the Brno community especially. So without waiting further, I will leave the stage to you and uh, for everyone have a great session. And if we have a bit of time at the end, we also have some space for questions and answer with Don. The stage is yours. Thanks very much, Damiano. Uh, yes, uh, I... Uh, been here for more than 50 years and I'm a, as you'll probably guess from this talk, I'm a, I'm a big Brno patriot. Um, the city of Brno has been around for well more than eight, almost 800 years. And if you sort of stand back and, and look at it from the point of view of its, its economic growth, you can see that there were basically three stages. Uh, the first stage was quite long, 500 years or so. And, and during that period, it was basically a trading city. Uh, and then that lasted up to the middle of the 18th century. And then in the second half of the 18th century, it started to switch to be a, an industrial city, a manufacturing city, an industrial city. And that lasted up until uh, the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and since the 1990s, Brno has been transformed. Uh, uh, and it's a city now that's based on, on the knowledge industry or whatever you want to call it, knowledge economy. Uh, and I want to talk uh, about this long period of almost 800 years, but I'm going to try and speak more on the second and third periods and the transition. Uh, so Brno was, was founded as a, as a trading city, and there were four groups uh, in, in, the, in the city that founded it. In, in, uh, just a moment, I'm very bad at this. I'm not, I'm not technology. Ah, oh, there it is. So Brno was founded in, in 1243, uh, and there were four groups. If you look at the city here, uh, and think of it as being divided into quarters. Up here in the left-hand quarter, it was settlers from, from the Low Countries, from what's now Belgium and the Netherlands. Up here, there were settles, settlers from the German German part of Europe. And the Don't lower I, half here was... So sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, are you sharing your screen? Because I think we uh, don't see it from our I end. Thought, I thought I was sharing my screen. Uh, just a moment, my mistake. Now no, I am. Uh, yes? Let's give it a second to see if it comes no and this yes it's coming now uh, yes sorry yes there it is or will be there yes sorry Should perfect be. thank you so much yeah. yeah okay my mistake uh so it was as i say if you think of it as being divided into quarters the the, the from the low countries belgium the netherlands were up there the germans were here down at the, the bottom here were the czechs and at the very very bottom here were, were the jews so there were these four groups that founded the city in 1243 uh, and it was not a, a major production center the way, for instance, Ghent or, or Bruges in, in, in Belgium that exported masses of, of cloth in the Middle Ages. It was more local, but it was situated on, on very important trading routes going sort of north, south uh, and east, west. It was quite prosperous. 
Uh, it's interesting, uh, one of the first guilds that was started was the, the first guild that was started in the city was the Wine Cellars Guild, That's just south of Brno, it's great wine country. And here you see a 16th century building, it's a magnificent uh, Renaissance palace that still remains in the city. And it was uh, owned by a man, he made his money in wine, in wine. so uh, it's, it's, it's a nice reminder of those periods. Um, the, in the 16th century, the uh, Czechs, uh, Czech territories came under the control of the Habsburg family. The Habsburgs ruled this vast empire in the, in the middle of, of Europe, in Central Europe, which uh, included not only Austria, uh, but uh, Hungary, parts of modern Romania, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Italy, Poland, and so on, this massive empire in the center of Europe. And the Czech lands, including uh, where we are now, the Czech Republic, uh, became part of them in the 16th century. Uh, and in 1641, uh, the uh, city of Brno was made the capital of Moravia. Moravia is the province that we're in within the Czech lands. Uh, and this uh, meant that there, uh, the links with Vienna became much stronger uh, since we were the Moravian capital. And Vienna, of course, was the metropolis. It was the capital of the empire. Uh, and this was uh, crucial for, for Brno uh, because Vienna is very close. It's uh, only about 110 kilometers away. That's 70 miles for people in, 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 in those countries that might still deal with miles. Uh, Brno, in fact, came to be called a suburb of Vienna. It was so close. Uh, and this was very important because it was very close to the metropolis and it was a source then of new ideas could come very quickly to Brno. Um, this uh, situation of Brno as a trading city lasted, as I said, up until uh, about the middle of the, of the, of the, of the uh, 18th century. And then uh, we turned into a, a, a or we started to turn into a manufacturing city, an industrial city. And we can pinpoint this exactly. It happened in 1763. This was the first textile manufacturer. It was a small building, not this one, but a small building like this, with these complicated looms. They were not, not ha they were hand looms still. They didn't have mechanical machinery. I mean, they weren't steam driven or anything, uh, but they were kind of a leap ahead. Very small scale, but very uh, complex machines and so on. And textiles then were at the core of Brno's prosperity for the next 200 plus years. Uh, in the first wave, uh, many of the entre entrepreneurs in the industry came from outside. Uh, they came from Germany, from Belgium, from, from England, from, from Scotland. They brought in, as entrepreneurs always do, they brought in know-how and they brought in capital. Uh, what was interesting, many of them were Protestants. At that time in the Austrian Empire, it was illegal to be a Protestant. It was a totally Catholic state. Uh, and uh, they had to make exceptions for these people because they needed their skills. But this had a profound effect then on the opening up of Brno in, in the sense of diversity and, and, and tolerance. Uh, and this was, could be then observed very much in succeeding, succeeding uh, years. The second wave of, of people came uh, in the second half, in the, in, in the uh, 19th century. Uh, and uh, they, we were now getting very big factories. Uh, you can see in the first stage, it's quite interesting. You see down here in the lower, lower corner, this is the very substantial, luxurious home of the factory owner. Uh, here's all his factory buildings very close so he could keep an eye on it. But his, his garden, his wonderful garden was in behind. This was very typical in the city. They were still very much sort of hands on, uh, even though they came to be called textile barons because many of them eventually got raised to the lower nobility because of their uh, great contributions to the uh, Austrian economy. Uh, and uh, in this second wave, uh, a lot of people were still coming from outside Austria, outside Moravia, uh, and uh, many, but also from inside now, and many of them were Jewish. So there was a large influx uh, of, Jew of Jews, and, and they became very, uh, very uh, important in the economy in Brno. Again, were welcomed and, and absorbed uh, in this tolerant milieu in Brno. Uh, and by the second half of the century, uh, we had massive factories. You can see these gigantic factories in Brno. And Brno came to be called, the nickname for Brno was the Moravian or the Austrian Manchester. 
Manchester as the quintessential textile factory, uh, textile town in, in England, uh, and us uh, here in Moravia or Austria, Brno in Moravia or Austria. Um, textiles, of course, once they took off, necessitated machinery. Once the, 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 the machine, the stream, the steam driven machinery uh, came, uh, they needed machines, and so it developed, the city began to develop the machine industry. Uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, we had a wonderful example of what we now call uh, industrial espionage. A local nobleman went incognito to England uh, and bribed people to give him plans for the latest English textile machinery. He, he smuggled them back inside his, his walking stick, his cane, uh, and uh, developed, you know, developed his factory this way. Um, but the, the machine, uh, the textile machines were, were built, and then this led to all kinds of other machinery uh, for, for different, different areas. So by the end of the 19th, 30, 20th century, you had these massive engineering works in Brno. Uh, you can see what they looked like in, in the photo, and the, this is from, let's say, 1900. This is what the factory looks like now. It's one of, the, one of these factories that actually has been preserved, and, and it's now a sort of heritage site. It's an art gallery, it's, it's, it's a social space and so on. It's, we're quite lucky about that. Um, it's not only this, as I said, because, because Brno was so close to Vienna, it meant that there were all kinds of firsts, not only in, not only in, in, in uh, these kind of textile things, uh, but in uh, railways, the first railway in the, now the Czech Republic uh, was uh, the Vienna, Vienna Brno, uh, railway in, in uh, opened in 1939. Here's a photograph of the, the first train coming in. Uh, it was a huge occasion, of course. They had four four trains, each of them with seven or eight uh, carriages. It was a huge kind of excursion for the sort of better off Viennese society to take this exciting trip on a train up to Brno for the day. Here you can see them being welcomed in Brno at the time. Uh, it's also kind of funny because on the way back, there was another first. Uh, and that was the first railway accident. <laughs> two, two of the trains collided with each other. Uh, but we also had the first uh, trams. It was now the Czech Republic. You can see this, this horse-drawn tram, uh, which uh, is still in the, in the property. It's pretty part of the property of the amazing uh, uh, transport museum of the city, city public transport uh, uh, department. But it was also innovation in all sorts of other ways. I mean, here was the Municipal Theatre in 1882, which was the the first uh, theater on the European continent to, to be lit by electrical light. As I said, this, this closeness to Vienna meant that uh, the city was always open to, to new ideas and, 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 and prided itself on being progressive uh, and, and so on. Uh, we come in then into the 20th century and um, the uh, Czechoslovakia becomes uh, independent. Um, at the end of the First World War, the whole Austrian Empire collapsed uh, and Czechoslovakia emerged as an independent state. Uh, one of the first effects was on Brno. Uh, you see here a map of 1919 when Great Brno was created. Up until then, Brno had just been this small little area, the historical core, basically, of the city. And it was surrounded by all these small little villages and a couple of other municipalities. In 1919, these were amalgamated. So there was this great leap forward. Uh, suddenly we had a city that has twice as many people, seven times as much territory. And the First Republic uh, then was brought sort of a new dynamism, I would say. Uh, Brno had previously been dominated by, by, by German speakers. Now with the addition of all of this new territory, uh, it, uh, it was uh, about 75%, most of these new villages were Czech speaking. It was now 70, 75% Czech speaking, 25, 30% German speaking. And there was an effort on the part of the Czechoslovak state to, to build up Brno as, as, a, as a genuine Czech city, right? So three new universities were founded, a lot of secondary schools, the highest legal institutions, the Supreme Court and so on were moved to Brno. And the cultural, cultural life sort of took off. There was a, there was a, this was a young democracy, Czechoslovakia, uh, progressive democracy. And so Brno was a kind of emblematic city for this, 
uh, with modern trends, modern trends in, in, in the arts, in architecture. This functionalism became uh, the main architectural style, this very, very uh, democratic style. It was, you know, it, it didn't have all sorts of complicated ornament and all the rest of it, sleek lines, minimalism, uh, roof terrace, for instance, here, as, as you bring in nature uh, on your roof terrace family house this way, public buildings were built in this, this very clean architectural style. And there are some amazing buildings in Brno dating from that time. Uh, the Villa Tumbenhat, uh, was uh, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was by the uh, German architect, Mies van der Rohe, uh, uh, first open, open plan uh, house uh, in the history of architecture. It's uh, is what I say symbolic, uh, that in fact it was built for a Jewish couple that were among the leading uh, industrials from, from the leading industrialist families, textile families in Brno. Again, textiles was still at the at the core of Brno's Brno's wealth. Uh, there were in, this is another functionalist building, the Cafe Era, this gorgeous, absolutely minimalist cafe, uh, influenced by the Dutch architectural style, the, the steel. Um, and there were industry was moving into new fields as well. Uh, Brno started producing cars, this wonderful Broyovka cars as they started producing. Uh, the Brenga, the, 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 the armaments, uh, the main armaments factory uh, was in Brno, uh, this Broyovka, uh, and they produced this Bren uh, light machine gun, which uh, it's an interesting word, the Bren gun. It was called because there was a cooperation between the main English armaments factory in Enfield and Brno, so they combined the names to Bren. This was the main light light machine gun that was used by the Allied forces in, in, in the Second World War. I have the photo there of the soldier carrying a Bren gun in the Second World War uh, because he's a Canadian soldier. I thought this was really nice, so I, I added it as a little bit of nationalist propaganda. Um, the um, After the Second World War, uh, the Second World War and its aftermath were pretty catastrophic for Brno. Huge impact. Uh, it was the most badly damaged of any of the Czech cities. And of course, there was a the human devastation. There was the loss of the Jewish population. And then in 19, or most of the Jewish population, 90% of the Jewish population, uh, because of the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, the um, all over Czechoslovakia in 1948, the 45, uh, the German-speaking population was expelled. And this hit Brno very hard uh, because it was the Czech city with the highest proportion of Germans. So roughly 25% of the population vanished overnight in May of 1945. And hardly was it recovering from that when the communist era became. Uh, uh, communist era came in 1948, lasted 40 years. Uh, that meant uh, isolation, that meant uh, difficulty to travel, it meant uh, difficult to, to have any books, reading material, whatever, from the West. Uh, the presence of foreigners was almost minimal. Here, here in Brno, a city of 400,000, there were five of us native English speakers in the communist years. Five native English speakers in a city of 400,000, hard to believe. And it, particularly, it meant stagnation. It meant buildings unrepaired and crumbling. It meant little investment in infrastructure. It meant uh, minimal innovation in industry. Uh, and when the communist system collapsed uh, at the end of 1989, it was followed very quickly by the almost total collapse of the Brno economy. Uh, they couldn't compete. Cheap Asian textiles flooded the markets and textile factory after textile factory went bankrupt. Uh, factories that had been producing these low quality goods, subsidized, could no longer compete on the international market and they began to go bankrupt. And so the question was what to do. And this is when we moved into the current phase of Brno as a, as a knowledge economy based city. We were very lucky after 1989 to have a fairly enlightened city council. Uh, and they set up tax, task forces who visited Western European cities that had gone through this simil similar economic collapse 10, 20 years earlier. And on the basis of that, they created the strategy of reinventing uh, the city of Brno as a, a city for research and development for information technology. Uh, it was based on um, 
several key factors. One was the universities. Brno had six, six public universities. Uh, uh, it had the highest ratio of students to, to the population of any city in the country. These universities covered virtually every field from, from the humanities right through science and, and in, you know, engineering and all the rest of it. Uh, it was the first informatics faculty in the country, was founded in 1994 and so on. There were some local quality products, particularly electron microscopes. And so the idea was on the basis of this, this uh, very good educational uh, um, complex, uh, they could then attract uh, foreign firms, international firms, uh, to, to come to Brno. And a combination of the city, of public institutions, and so on over the next uh, 15, 20 years made the difference. Um, the city uh, set up a very, very effective uh, strategy development office, which gave priority to this, this, this new development. It, and it's, it's continuing. It still continues. Right now, they have a very ambitious strategy for the development of the city up till 2000, 20, 2050, which is a long-term thing, uh, 2050. Um, uh, a lot of the public institutions uh, accomplished some major achievements, initiatives. Uh, the Czech Technology Park was founded immediately uh, in, in the first Czech Technology Park in, 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 in the country. Uh, founded by a, a Brno native who had emigrated after 68 and became head of Bovis in England, the largest, one of the largest uh, building firms in the world. And they came back and set up this Czech uh, technology park in combination with the Technical University and uh, the city of Brno. Uh, the uh, Masaryk University uh, created a new campus, which is the largest uh, university infrastructure project in, in Central Europe, in fact, bringing together the medical faculty, the part of the science faculties, and, and many research institutes, the sports faculty as well. Um, and then four of the universities got together to create a university of technology with different centers. This is the university, uh, Central European Institute of Technology, uh, and the Bremer University of Technology has one center, Masaryk University has another center, and so on. And finally, there was an international clinic research center. It's the only uh, health research center funded in Europe by, by uh, EU, EU money. So these major research centers. Private was more problem. Uh, oh, interesting. Oh, sorry. I don't need this anymore. I'll get rid of it. The private sector. Oh, the private sector was more complicated because. Uh, I, just, just get rid of that for me. Hold on. Was more problematic because there was a lack of infrastructure here. I got involved in the around 2000, 2001, 2. I was head of the international office at the university. And uh, no, no, no. several times a year, uh, several times a year, the, the Czech Invest would bring a potential investor to Brno. Uh, and I, they would take me out to lunch because my job was to, to talk to these people and tell them what a wonderful city Brno was and the university base and so on and so on. And after a while, I said, it's interesting, and none, none of these firms seem to be seem to be ending up decided for Brno. And I asked the Czech invest people why this was. And he said, well, the problem is there's no state-of-the-art infrastructure. A, a firm, an international firm comes to Brno and says, oh, we'd like to start here. Yeah, it looks like a great place. We want to start in six months. And then Czech invest would have to say, well, unfortunately, there's not really any proper in infrastructure, maybe in a year or two years. And that was the end of things. So it wasn't until private firms were established and started building um, building um, parks of various kinds, uh, business parks, that then the place could turn up. And this happened around 2005, 2006. And since then, it's been this incredible kind of very, very steep curve. And the result has been a transformation of the economy, a transformation of the infrastructure, visually, of course. Uh, transformation of the makeup of the city, because these uh, university research institutes, plus these international firms in Brno, uh, have brought a lot of foreigners to the city. There's certainly well over 50,000 foreigners in the city now. It's a city of 400,000, certainly well over 50,000. Let's say 15% of the city population now. Uh, and uh, Brno has become known abroad. 
uh, it's uh, been it's it, you it's very common now to see articles being published in leading Western newspapers, The Guardian, The New York Times, and so on about Vernal, various aspects of Vernal. So, can you hear me? What's the problem? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Uh, sorry, I took the liberty to remove the, the presentation from the screen so we can see you. Aha, uh -huh. okay, right. Yeah. Okay, I'm coming to an end now, anyway. Um, so it would be coming well known abroad and so on. Um, Verno, of course, until recently was utterly unknown abroad. My favorite story about this is when a, my bank in England sent me a, a letter in the 1970s in Brno. It was addressed to me with my address in Brno. And the, the, the person who had sent the letter, typed up the letter from Brno, had addressed it to Don Sparling and my street address. Porno Czechoslovakia, porno Czechoslovakia. <laughs> Brno was just something that didn't even look as if it could be pronounced. Well, Brno is a little bit better known than it was then back then. And the city itself has been very much transformed. It's a very uh, lively city. It's a very young city. Uh, it's a very experimental city. And one of the experiments, I'll just have a little, this is the commercial bit at the end. Uh, the city of Brno, in order to uh, help attract foreigners, uh, it cooperates with us or we cooperate with the city. The Brno Expat Center is an NGO which is largely financed by the city, also by the uh, many of the leading international firms in Brno. Uh, and our job is to uh, get uh, to be a place where people who are thinking of coming to Brno, who already have agreement with firms who are coming to Brno, people who are settling in Brno physically, people who have problems in Brno, foreigners. Um, uh, um, highly educated foreigners, uh, there, are, there are the people that we work with, uh, and uh, we uh, are, the city is very, very happy that it's able to do this, but it's interesting, it was the first city in this country uh, to, to, to come up with this idea, uh, or we presented them with the idea, and they accepted this idea that, it, that the city should be making these extra efforts to attract foreigners to Brno. So, that's it for now. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was perfectly on time, first of all, but also super interesting. Um, well, if anybody has any question, please write it in the chat and we're happy to, to ask someone while he's here. I did have a little question for you, John, that I was thinking about uh, because you were describing, of course, how Bernard at the beginning being close to Vienna, there was a geographical benefit, of course, in kind of offsetting some of the work there, the cost of manufacturing and so on and so forth. From what you know, right, the resurrection, the technological resurrection of Brno, did that depend on geographical elements too, or was it the, really the human capital that was still present in the city, regard, despite you know, World War II and what happened in that period of time? I think it was the human capital. Uh, this, this, the closeness to Vienna was not so important. Uh, I suppose the main importance now of being close to Vienna is, is that they've got a big international airport, you know, yeah. Brno, Brno has a quote international airport, but it's very small and has, has, has very, very few flights, right? But otherwise, no, it, 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 it depended on internal capital. Of course, now it depends on external, uh, internal human capital. Uh, now it depends on external capital coming in because the, the growth of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, these, these firms in Brno is phenomenal. Even during COVID, they, the numbers of foreigners in Brno increased, right? And we need the foreigners from outside. Uh, and so the, the, um, you know, the aim has to be to, to, to make the city as attractive as possible for foreigners. And that's, that's part of our job in the expat center, of course. Uh, but the city of Brno does everything it can as well in terms of providing services, if possible, in English and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a, we, we're, we're sucking in capital from, we're very fortunate. I should say, it's not so much Vienna. What we're very fortunate in is being beside Slovakia. Right. I hate to say it, but there's a huge brain drain from Slovakia, and we're we're first in line because we're, <laughs> we're, the receiving end of the. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, seventy percent of the foreign students at Masaryk University are from Slovakia, right? Right. Uh, and, right. and you go into the center of Brno, and you go into shops, and you 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 hear as, as much Slovak almost being spoken as you hear Czech, right? It's it's incredible. Right. So that, that human capital has been extremely important for us.
Very good point. We did actually receive a question also in the QA session. I know that we're almost out of time, but this is a very good question. So I want to take the time. Nero is asking, how did you end up in Brno 50 years plus? Uh, it's, I, I came thinking I would teach English for a year. It's very strange. It was after this, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. Uh, but I had visited just before the invasion and I found it a fascinating country. It's a beautiful country. It's got incredible historical resources, you know, chateaus and castles. It's got beautiful countryside and very, very amazing people. Uh, and so I, the, the, I visited before the invasion, it was after the invasion, uh, and I was thinking, I had been studying in England for two years, finished that, and I thought, oh, I'd like to stay in Europe for another year. Hmm. And after the invasion, I became very curious. I'm from Ottawa in Canada, the capital city of Canada, and I'm a political junkie. I, my whole life has been, so I've been interested in politics. And right. I, was very, I was very curious after the invasion, because if you know anything about the invasion in 68, it took a long time for the invading Soviets to, to really close down the country. Uh, and it still seemed as if some of the gains of the Prague Spring could be, could be maintained. So I was very curious to see what actually was happening on the ground. So I came thinking I would teach English at a language school for, for a year and then go back to Canada. And I was here for a year and then I was in Prague for seven years. Then, yes, I met a woman, I got married uh, and <laughs> There's always right. story. It's always, it's always share, share, not that, right? We know this, right? Uh, and uh, so then I came back to her. I wanted to be, she didn't want to go to Prague and she didn't want to go to Canada, which was also exceptional. Many Czech women were very happy to marry a foreigner and uh, move abroad. Uh, so I came back and at that point a position came open in the university. So that's, that's my story. That is a fascinating story. We also got one last question. Hopefully this is a quick one, but because people okay. are really loving, by the way, the stories, I, they're really, really having a good time. Do you think, in your experience, is it absolutely necessary to learn Czech or Slovak to be able to live there and access, you know, the doctor, the supermarket? No, banks? no, no. Obviously, you know, if you have Czech, you can access them better. But I mean, of this, these 50,000 foreigners that are here, there are not that many that are fluent in Czech. Well, some of them are, they're not. I mean, yes, no, this, this has changed totally. And it's also, this, it's just because of the presence of, it's, it's like a, it's like a um, chicken and the egg kind of thing. Yeah, right. In my opinion, the, 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 the thing that came first was this sharp, uh, sharp rise in the number of foreigners uh, and people, uh, people uh, realized they just had to learn English and, and be able to communicate with them. It was also helped by the fact that English back around 2000 was introduced as a compulsory subject in schools from grade one. So you're getting a whole new generation of people who've, who've had, you know, already, you know, English yeah. during their education. But no, you, you can certainly come here. I encourage people to come here. Uh, and we're here to help you as well if you're having problems. Uh, I mean, what a better introduction, seriously, knowing that there was people like you, right, that are helping people getting there. And I have to say that when you were mentioning before how during the manufacturing textile phase, uh, people from Brno were going to learn from like Manchester, the secrets of textiles. I think there are many cities in Europe now, Munich, where I live at the moment, that should learn from Brno how to welcome this capital, how to make things accessible. I'm super happy to hear that all of this is actually happening in a city like Brno. I know that we are over time. I really want to say thank you, Don. This has been super, super interesting. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for giving me the chance. As I said, I'm a great Brno patriot. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. To everybody, thank you so much for taking this time with us. Have a great time for the rest of the afternoon, and we will come back together at 7 for the quiz with Radek. Remember that there are prizes to be won at the end, and uh, for closing this beautiful conference together. Uh, afterwards. Thank you again. Thanks very much, Damian. Bye-bye. No, Damiano. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao. Ciao.